hey guys here is the whole of AQA C1 in one video now to go with this I've written you a little revision guide you can go over to my website and get that for free Now in an atom we have several things, in the nucleus we have protons, we have neutrons and then all around the outside in shells we have electrons. Now this is a really really fake drawing because the size of the nucleus is tiny compared to what would be the massive size of shells but I can't really draw it like that because my screen is not big enough. So what you need to know is that a proton is plus one, neutrons are neutral, and electrons have a minus one charge overall. Here is the periodic table, and your life is going to become much, much easier in chemistry if you understand lots and lots about the periodic table, because it tells us so, so much. If we look at one element from the periodic table, you'll see there's loads and loads of information. We have the symbol for the elements. Now, most of the time, this is related to the name, but not always. I'm just going to highlight W in here, which is tungsten. Uh, potassium over here, which is uh, K, potassium. And Na just up here, which is sodium. So don't get confused. So often I see people writing S for sodium. That is sulfur. Don't write S for sodium. The other thing the periodic table will tell us is the name of um, whatever we're looking at. And then there are two numbers on there. Now these two numbers, it doesn't matter where they are located. Different um, like planners, different textbooks, different examples are going to put them in different positions. It does not matter where they are located. The big number, the large number of the two is the mass number. And the smaller number of the two is the atomic number. The atomic number and the mass number tell us lots of bits of information. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons and it is equal to the number of electrons in an atom. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if we wanted to work out the number of neutrons or something, we could just do neutrons equals mass minus atomic. Now the periodic table has groups and periods on it. The groups are these ones that go down here like this. This is group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight or group zero. And that tells us the number of electrons on the outer shell. So it's really easy and quickly to see that sulfur is in group 6, so it is going to have 6 electrons on its outer shell. We can see that calcium is in group 2, so it is going to have 2 electrons on its outer shell. Aluminium is in group 3, so it's going to have 3 electrons on its outer shell. Going across, we have the periods. Now, don't forget hydrogen and helium at the top there. One, two, three, four. Now, the periods tell us the number of electron shells. So we can see that magnesium is going to have three electron shells and it's going to have two electrons on its outer shell. 
we can see that phosphorus is going to have three electron shells and it's going to have five electrons on its outer shell. We can use the periodic table to remind us how many electrons go in each shell. So here is the first shell and it has one, two elements in it. So in the first electron shell we need to put two electrons. Here is the second shell or the second period and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in it. So we can put eight electrons in the second shell. Here is the third and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in it. So we can put eight. And then here is the fourth and we only got to calcium. So one, two there. So those are the maximum number of electrons we can fit into each shell. If we draw a squiggly line down here, we can see the difference between the non-metals and the metals on this side. When we're drawing the electronic arrangement of something, we need to look at the number of electrons and its position on the periodic table. So if we look at calcium, which has 20 electrons, you can see it is in period 4 and it is in group 2. Now the 20 electrons tells us how many electrons we need to draw, the period tells us how many shells and the group tells us how many electrons on the outer shell. So here's calcium in the middle, period 4, so we need 4 shells, 1, 2, 3, Four. We start filling up from the middle using um, our rules here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. You'll notice that on the first shell I just put two, on the second shell I just put eight, on the third shell I just put eight, and now on the fourth shell I'm just going to put two. That takes us up to 20, and there are two electrons on the outer shell. Sodium's atomic number is 11, which means we are going to have 11 protons, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and in an atom, 11 electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, in an atom with an equal number of protons and electrons, there is going to be no overall charge. If, however, we um, have an ion where we have lost or gained electrons, this electron here is going to go somewhere else, so it's not there anymore. You can see we now have more um, protons than we do electrons, so we have made an ion which does have an overall charge. And depending on how many electrons they have either lost or gained, that will tell you what the charge is. As a really quick rule of thumb, things in group 1 are going to have plus 1 charge. Things in group 2 are going to have a plus 2 charge. Group 7 are going to have a minus 1 charge. And group 6 are going to be minus 2. Covalent bonding is going to happen between non-metals. And this is sharing of electrons. Now there are a few common ones the exam board will expect you to know. This is hydrogen chloride. What you need to do is have your overlapping circles. Chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons and then one from hydrogen. Make sure you have your overlapping circles and you draw your um, electrons in the middle. Methane, which is CH4. And carbon is going to have one, two, three, four, and then each of the hydrogens gives one. Water, which is going to have an oxygen in the middle, hydrogens either side, one, two, three, four, five, six from oxygen, and then another two from the hydrogens, and ammonia, which is NH3. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, 
3. These are the simple molecules the exam board expects you to know about and expects you to be able to draw. Ionic bonding occurs between a metal and a non-metal. So something that is on the right hand side of the periodic table and something that is on the left hand side of the periodic table. If we use sodium chloride as an example, here we have sodium with one electron on the outer shell and chlorine with seven electrons on the outer shell. What is going to happen is this electron here is going to go over there because everything wants to have a full outer shell. And what we are going to end up with afterwards in square brackets is chlorine and sodium having a full outer shell. Chlorine with its seven original electrons and then the extra one it has gained from sodium. Now because sodium has lost an electron it is going to have a positive charge and because chlorine has gained an electron it is going to have a negative charge. Metals are going to form positive ions and non-metals are going to form negative ions. And between these positive and these negative ions, they are going to build up this massive, massive lattice. And there are going to be really, really strong bonds in between them. There are very, very strong attractions. And because they have such strong attractions, this leads to their properties. So the properties are that they are going to have high boiling points because you're going to need a lot of energy to separate out these things. High melting points. When they are a solid, they are not going to conduct electricity. But they are going to conduct when molten or dissolved. And the reason they're only going to conduct when they're molten or dissolved is because this is when the ions are going to be free to move around. Over on the far right hand side of the periodic table, we have the noble gases. Or group 8, also known as group 0. Now these are very, very happy because they have a full outer shell. They do not want to lose any electrons, they do not want to gain any electrons. They are very, very happy as they are. They don't want to change anything. By the time you get this far in the course, the examiner is going to expect that you can balance equations perfectly. So here is a particularly tricky one for us to practice on. We have aluminium, um, N O A L M N O. O. We have one, we have one, we have two, we have two, we have one, we have three. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a two in front of there. That gives me two there. Um, now because I have an of an oxygen, so I have an even number on one side and an odd number on the other side, what I'm going to do is just put a two in front of there um, just to make my numbers even because even numbers are much, much easier to work with. That gives me a four, that gives me a six, which means I need to change that one there into a four, that gives me four. Um, then I need to get some more oxygen, so let's get rid of that, let's pop a three in front of there. I have three of those, I have six of those, let's pop a three in front of there, and I have three of those. If you cannot balance that equation, um, and I know it's a particularly tricky one, but the examiners are going to throw particularly tricky ones at you. So if you can't balance that sort of equation, you need to practice. Um, I suggest you pop over to my website where I've just published a book which includes loads and loads of equations for you to balance. Here we have the limestone cycle. Now limestone is that white, chalky, powdery rock. Now you may have heated it up quite a lot. And notice that we gave a gas off, which is CO2, and then it turned into this white crumbly powder, which is calcium oxide. The formula for that is CaO. Calcium carbonate over here is CaCO3. And yes, you do need to know all of these formulas. 
So after we heated up the limestone, the calcium carbonate, um, you had to heat it for quite a long time. This is quite a dangerous experiment to do. You got the crumbly calcium oxide and then you needed to add in water and you made calcium hydroxide. Now calcium hydroxide you've probably used a lot throughout your time at school because it's known as lime water. And what we do when we have lime water, we blow into it, we add in carbon dioxide, it goes cloudy. And the reason it goes cloudy is because we're reforming limestone. This is a limestone cycle. They really do like asking questions about this. They could ask you um, word equations. They could ask you to balance chemical equations. It's really worth knowing this bit really well. You need to know that if we mix a metal carbonate with an acid, we are going to get a salt, water and carbon dioxide. Or if we heat up a metal carbonate, we are going to get a metal oxide and carbon dioxide. Now, this is looks complicated, but isn't actually that bad. So all you need to do is replace the word metal with the actual metal we're looking at. So if we're talking about calcium carbonate, um, we just replace uh, metal, so the calcium carbonate heated up turns into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, or magnesium carbonate heated up turns into magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. Just pick whichever metal they're talking about and replace the word metal with that. They love asking about the test for carbon dioxide. Now you may have done an experiment like this in the lab where you had some metal um, carbonate in the bottom of the test tube here. You were heating it up, you probably had to heat it quite strongly. Um, you had a delivery tube and a um, bung in the top of the test tube. And what happened is that the bubbles of carbon dioxide when they came off went through here went into the lime water, and if carbon dioxide was present, the lime water goes cloudy. So the test for carbon dioxide is that lime water goes cloudy. Here is a limestone quarry. You can see the white rock and you can see the, the scars of the landscape where it's been dug out of the earth. But there are some advantages to a limestone, limestone quarry, namely the jobs that it provides for the people working there. And not only the jobs that it provides for the people working there, but it's going to increase um, local businesses. Now, these local businesses could be cafes, they could be um, local pubs, it could be the local petrol station, um, because all of these people bit that work at the quarry need to go and get their lunch somewhere, they need to go and fill up their cars somewhere. Now, limestone is incredibly useful. We use it for things like toothpaste, we use it in medicines, we use it in bread, and we use it in farming. We use it for making cement, concrete, we use it for building. Our economy it depends to a large amount on limestone, so we need to dig quite a lot of it out of the ground. There are some disadvantages to the amount of limestone that we need to dig out of the ground. First of all, it is very noisy. Um, there's lots of explosions, lots of digging, um, lots of things going on. It is also very dusty. Um, people that have asthma or people that have other respiratory conditions are really going to suffer living next to or close to a limestone quarry because of the amount of dust that it flows up into the air. There are lots of different types of pollution. So not only the noise pollution and the um, air pollution, but also the visual pollution. People don't necessarily like the look of it. Um, but there is going to be a lot of traffic from um, lorries going into and out of the quarry. Now this quarry here, you can see that it started to fill up with water um, at the bottom. This gives you an indication of maybe what they're planning on doing with the quarry afterwards. Because even though um, at the moment it doesn't look very nice, what they can do once they finish quarrying out all the limestone is actually turning it into something a bit more useful. For example, one of my favourite shopping centres is built in an old limestone quarry. They could fill it up and turn it into a water sports lake or um, grass over the top and turn it into a nature reserve. There are lots of different things they could do with it. Things that limestone can be used to make are cement, mortar and concrete. Now cement is made by heating limestone.
Mortar is made by mixing cement, sand and water. And then concrete is made by mixing aggregate of small rocks with cement, sand and water. Here we have the reactivity series. Now these are all of the metals on the reactivity series, apart from carbon here, which obviously you know is a non-metal. The only reason it's in there is so that we can think about the different ways of extracting things. Now things right down at the bottom are generally found as pure metal. That is because they are so unreactive, they don't, they don't react with the oxygen in the air, so they're not going to form a metal oxide, which is how rocks are generally found. Things that are below carbon are generally going to be um, purified from that ore by reduction. And then things that are above carbon, which are very reactive, need electrolysis. Now, as I just mentioned, most of these are found in the earth as ores, spelt like that. An ore is just a rock. And the important thing about ores is that they need to have enough metal in them to make it economically worth the, the company extracting the metal from it. If it's not going to be economical, then the company is just not going to do it. It's just going to leave the, the rock, the ore, where it is. Now, reduction is removing oxygen and electrolysis is purification using electricity. Copper is an incredibly important metal. It's in all of our um, electrical wires because it has such um, good, good electrical conductivity. But the problem is, there's not a lot of it around. So we need to find more copper or get new and innovative ways of getting copper out of the ground. And two of these new and innovative ways are bioleaching and phytomining. Uh, Bioleaching is where you say have a lake which is full of copper, you put some bacteria in there, the bacteria will then um, take up the copper in there, you can then take the bacteria out and then you collect the, the, the leachate from the bacteria. So it's kind of like uh, collecting the bacteria's wee. And the bacteria's wee is going to have all of the copper that the, cop that the bacteria has taken up from the lake in it. The other way is phytomining. Now, phytomining sounds a bit weird, a bit like the bioleaching, because what you do is you get a field that doesn't have a lot of copper in it, and you plant a load of broccoli. Yep, broccoli. And then once you've planted that broccoli, once it's grown, um, you can chop down the broccoli and you can burn it, and then you can get the copper out of the um, ashes. Now, the problem with both of these is that they take quite a long time. It takes quite a few months to grow broccoli, and you can probably only do this like once or twice a year. So these are not quick methods, these are not easy methods, but they are new and innovative methods to get um, our hands on copper because we have a big problem that we just don't have enough of it. Now, pure metals have layers. which means they can slide, whereas an alloy doesn't have any layers. You can see that big brown blob in the middle disrupting the layers. If there is no layers, there is no sliding. If there is no sliding, it makes it harder, which means alloying a metal improves its properties, it's gonna make it much more useful for things. The last type of metal you need to know about is shape memory. And that just means it can remember its original shape. So if it becomes deformed, say if you break your braces or you sit on your glasses, um, it can easily go back to its original shape.
crude oil is a big, thick, gunky mixture that we dig out of the ground and it is a mixture of different length, hydrocarbons. Now a hydrocarbon is something that is made of hydrogen plus carbon only. Fractional distillation is a process where we separate out all the different lengths of the hydrocarbons that come in crude oil. So here is a fractional distillation column and we heat up the crude oil and it goes in here. And it works its way up until it finds its condensing point. Now at the top here we are going to have short chains. And at the bottom we are going to have long chains. And these have very, very different properties depending on how high they are, or how long they are, sorry. So short chains are going to have low boiling points, and long chains are going to have high boiling points. The short ones are going to be very volatile, and the long ones are not going to be very volatile. The long ones are going to be very thick and viscous. That's like honey, so really, really hard to pour. Whereas the short ones are generally going to be gas, so they're going to be very, very runny, so that's going to have very low viscosity. The short ones are going to make good fuels and are going to be very flammable. Whereas the long chain ones are not going to be flammable. These long hydrocarbons that come out at the bottom of a fractional distillation column aren't actually very useful. So what we can do upon um, application of heat and a catalyst is crack them into shorter ones. So we can have a short alkane plus a short alkene. So we're going to have a double bond in there. But remember with any equation we have to balance it. We can't lose or gain hydrogen so always make sure your hydrogens and your carbons on both sides add up. When we're looking at alkanes we need to think about breaking the name into two parts. The first part will tell us the number of carbons. And the second part will tell us the type of bonding. Now in an alkane, we are only going to have single bonding. Now I've put a little reference table up over here so we can check how many um, carbons we have. So if we look at the first one, if we look at methane, the first part of the name, meth, tells us it's going to be one carbon, and the second part of the name tells us it's going to be single bonding. Now when we are drawing um, hydrocarbons, carbon makes four bonds, and hydrogen only makes one bond. So here we have methane. If we were then going to move on to draw ethane, that has two bonds, you draw carbon, carbon, each carbon has to make four bonds, Hydrogen, use that to fill in all the gaps, that can only make one bond. And so on, all the way up to hexane. Alkenes are very similar to alkanes, but we can see that the ending of the name is ever so slightly different, and this has double bonds. It doesn't matter, unless there are numbers in there, which they may do, but they might not do, um, where that double bond goes. So we can't have methane because we need to have a double bond between two carbons. So if we look at propene, carbon, 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 
we need a double bond. Carbon can make four bonds, so the first one already has one, two, three, four. Second one already has one, two, three, four. One in there, two, three, four. And because it's a hydrocarbon, only has hydrogen and carbon in, so we can fill the rest up with hydrogens. If we were going to go on and draw butene, one, two, three, four um, carbons, double bond, doesn't matter where it goes, four on that one, four on that one, four on that one, four on that one. This can be quite confusing, and I do have lots of other videos on this topic if you want to see more videos about drawing this. But most of the time they will give you a scaffold to fill in. The most important thing to remember is to work out whether it's single bonds or double bonds, and to remember how many thing bonds um, carbon and hydrogen make. Now remembering whether it's a double bond for an alkene or an alkane can be quite complicated, but a good trick is to look at the number of E's. So an alkane has one E, so it's going to have single bonds, and an alkene has two E's, so it's going to have a double bond in there. If we want to test if something has a double bond, we need to add bromine water. And if a double bond is present, it will go from orange to colourless. They love asking about this test. It is really, really worth learning it. Um, every year, every other year, it comes up in the examiner's report that people get this test wrong. So please learn this one. There are two different types of combustion that you need to know about, and this is just burning hydrocarbons. So for complete combustion, we can take our hydrocarbon, add it to oxygen, because whenever anything burns, it needs to be in oxygen. And we're going to get two products. We are going to get carbon dioxide and water. Now the problem with releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is that it is a greenhouse gas and it's contributing to climate change. Incomplete combustion has a large number of problems associated with it. So it starts off the same way. But we have a much broader range of products. So we have our carbon dioxide. and our water, but we also have carbon monoxide, which is a toxic gas which will kill you while you're asleep and you won't even notice, um, and it will release carbon, which is responsible for global dimming. Um, now this is just um, combustion or things that are pure hydrocarbons. When we're burning fuels, when we're burning petrol, we're burning fossil fuels, we're also going to be getting some other things out like sulfur dioxide which contributes to um, acid rain and we're going to get um, nitrogen oxide which are another poisonous gas which also causes acid rain. So combustion of things is quite um, dangerous. Now complete combustion, that is when you see your Bunsen burner burn with a blue flame and incomplete combustion, that is when you see your Bunsen burner burn with an orange flame. Here we have ethene. We know it's ethene because there are two carbons and the only thing that has two carbons in is an eth and we know it's an ene because it has this double bond in here and this is a monomer. Now monomer just means one bit. Now what we can do is polymerize this and make a polymer. Polymer just means poly, lots of bits. So we go from one bit to lots of bits. And what happens here is one of these double bonds breaks and its arms stretch outwards. The hydrogen stay in the same place. and we draw square brackets around it 
and we put a little N after it and a big N in front of it. Now, sometimes they might give you something else instead of four carbons. That's okay, don't worry, just treat it exactly the same way as this. Break that double bond in the middle and stretch it outside and then just draw everything else exactly the same as you see it. Now, when we're polymerizing something, all we do to change the name is put poly in front of it. So this is polyethene. There are two different ways of making ethanol. You can make it by fermentation. Where you take some sugar. Um, now this can be in the form of um, um, some fruit or some hops or anything like that and then we need to add in some yeast. Now this is just going to be, this is the enzyme, this is just going to be the catalyst that's going to turn the sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Now the advantage to doing it this way is that sugar is a renewable resource. We can just keep growing more um, apples or grapes or hops or whatever it is we want to turn um, into our ethanol. Um, it's a batch um, production source so we can only do like one batch at a time and um, the problem is if there's too much ethanol gets in it starts to kill off the yeast so that we had to keep renewing it all the time we can't just have it keep going and going and going and going um, other problems are that the amount of land that it takes up to grow um, the hops could be used for growing food and things like that the other way we can do this is by hydration where we're going to take some ethene, add in some water or some steam, and then we're going to make ethanol. The advantage of doing it this way is it's a continuous process so that we don't have to stop, it just keeps going, keeps going, and keeps going. Um, and that it's 100% efficient. So um, in fermentation we have carbon dioxide as a waste product. In this we don't have any waste products. The problem with this one is that ethene is comes from crude oil. So it is a finite and non-renewable resource. And ethene crude oil is used for loads and loads of other things so there's not much of it around. There are two different ways you can extract vegetable oils from um, plants. This could be the, the seeds of the plants, or it could be um, the flowers of the plants, um, but when you want to get the oil out, there are two different ways of doing it. You can distill it, so you take some um, steam or some hot water, pass that through the, the seeds or the oil, um, and the oil will evaporate or will come out into the water and then you can separate the two out or you can do it by crushing. So just getting a pestle and a mortar and crushing the seeds or the flowers up until the oil comes out. Cooking with vegetable oils is good because they have a very, very high boiling point, which means we can cook things much higher, make them crispier, so we can get um, much nicer chips if we cook them in oil as opposed to if we cook them in water. The problem with this is that they increase the energy content of the um, food that they're cooking. Now, for vegetable oils, they're not very easy to spread, so we can harden them. Or this is also referred to as like changing the amount of unsaturation in them. Now, this question comes up, they ask it in lots of different ways, and there are three simple things you need to write down to get the marks. What you need to write down is that it needs a nickel catalyst. It needs to be done at 60 degrees C, and it needs hydrogen. Lots of different ways they can ask this question, but that is what they're looking for if they do. When we have a mixture of oil and water, they do not mix. We have this layer of crust here where the water down here and the oil up here are clearly separated, but we can add an emulsifier in. Here I'm adding in egg yolk, but there are other things you could use like um, mustard powder that will also work as an emulsifier. Now the way the emulsifier works is it's a little blobby bit that looks 
like this. And it has some fancy um, properties of the head and the tail. So the head bit is attracted to water. And the tail bit is attracted to oil. Now the fancy words for this, the bit that is attracted to the water is hydrophilic. And the bit that is attracted to oil is hydrophobic. So you just saw me shaking those there. Um, I'm going to leave these out to separate and then you will see that rather quickly, the one with no emulsifying, you can start to see the separation between the oil and the water again. Whereas this one over this side that does have the emulsifier in, um, it's taken quite a long time for anything to happen. You can maybe start to see a bit of a line, but it doesn't really ever separate back out into oil and water. Now, when you get a little um, oil droplet, what you're going to have is the heads being on the outside and the tails being on the inside. This is how you can get your oil and your water mixed up because they form these really tight little, um, little bubbles of oil within water or the other way around of water within oil. So the, the outside is completely coated in the hydrophobic and water loving sections and the tails are all dissolved in the water, oil sorry very rough sketch of our earth. The green line around the outside is the crust. Now this is incredibly, incredibly thin. Um, this is the bit that we walk on, this is the bit that we drill into, this is the bit that all the plants grow on, but it is so thin compared to everything else. This bit here is the mantle. Now this is kind of like a solid liquid, it's slightly weird, this is a bit where the convection currents are going on that causes the, the crust to move around. Then we have the outer core and the inner core. Now because of the large amounts of radioactivity that's going on in the core, heat is released, which means this bit of the mantle is getting heated up. As it gets heated up, it gets less dense, so it rises. As it gets to the top, it's no longer heated up, so it gets more dense, it cools and falls back down to the bottom. This is thinking back to convection currents in our physics. That is how we get plate tectonics, how we get the plates moving around, it leads to earthquakes and it leads to volcanoes. Earth is covered in the crust, which is split into tectonic plates. Now there are going to be several of these plates, and where they meet, there are going to be fault lines. Now these tectonic plates, because of the convection currents in the Earth, are moving backwards, and they're moving forwards. They're moving together, they're moving away from each other, and they are rubbing at side to side as well. And when these move around, so we're going to get things like um, volcanoes and we're going to get earthquakes. Now, because these moved around, um, over billions and billions of years, over the lifetime of the Earth, the pattern of the continents has actually changed quite a lot. The land masses that we see today used to all be together in a large land mass called Pangaea. Now there are two bits of evidence for Pangaea, the fact that the current continents fit together like a puzzle piece and the fossil records. Well, we have similar um, fossils from dinosaurs on land masses that are now geographically very, very far apart, but billions and billions of years ago would have been very, very close together. When the Earth was first formed, it was a very, very different place um, 4.5 billion years ago. The surface was covered in volcanoes, and all the gases that came out of the volcanoes made up that atmosphere. So the main gases are going to be your carbon dioxide and your water, with a little bit of methane and ammonia in there as well. Basically, it would have stank. Methane is like um, farts, and ammonia is the stuff that comes out in wheeze, 
So think like really, really stinky farts and weak old, like month old baby nappies. It really, really would have hummed. Wouldn't have been a very nice place to be. But this isn't what the atmosphere at the moment is like. There's been quite a lot of evolution um, for the atmosphere to get the way it is. And the reason because of this is because at the beginning there were some blue-green algae and they started to do some photosynthesis. With the photosynthesis, they took in the carbon dioxide with the water and they turned that into oxygen gas, which we can breathe, and um, sugar. I'm going to cheat and not balance that equation. No, I'm actually going to balance that equation just because I am. Um, and all of this oxygen... You don't need to know how to balance that one, by the way. And all of this oxygen that was there um, in the atmosphere led to more plants being able to grow. And it led to animals being able to grow. And then the ammonia and the methane reacted with the oxygen mm. in the um, atmosphere as well. And it led to things um, breaking down. So the ammonia and the methane in the atmosphere broke down. And it increased the level of nitrogen in the atmosphere at the moment. So that we get our present day atmosphere. Which is 79, 78% nitrogen gas. It is going to be about 21% oxygen gas. And then there's going to be trace amounts of argon and carbon dioxide and other gases as well. In 1953, two scientists called Miller and Ure did an experiment to try and work out how life on Earth started. They set up a very large apparatus and they tried to simulate the early atmosphere. So they put in carbon dioxide, they put in water, so they made it very, very humid. Um, they put in a bit of ammonia, a bit of methane, and they gave it electric shocks to simulate all of the lightning that would have been. And what they found after a few days is kind of like a gooey, gunky soup. And in this gooey gunky soup, they found amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks that we need for life. Now, there are a number of theories about how life on Earth started. And this isními. just one theory. So this is the primordial soup theory. The idea that life on Earth could have started based on the conditions in the early atmosphere. There are lots of different ways that carbon can move around our um, planet. So we can have carbon from the air going down into plants by photosynthesis. And then we can also have the reverse, which is respiration. We can have animals respiring as well. And then plants and animals can die. Now, once things are dead, two different things can happen to them. They can be buried and they can turn into fossil fuels, or they can be burnt and then they can be back um, as carbon dioxide in an atmosphere. Now, if things um, are fossil fuels burning again, will release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Well done for making it to the end, guys. That was quite a long video, a bit of a hard slog there. Um, good luck for your exams. If there's anything you need, just let me know and I'll do my very, very best to help you out.